Hello, olá, todo mundo. Let me just look for our guest here. Yeah. Great, man. That was fast. All right. How you doing, Marcos? I'm doing great. How about you, Mark? I'm doing great. I got a little bit of a head cold and fighting, but uh, I'm I'm here. Never uh, pardon the uh, throat loss. I'm just trying to keep my throat moist here. Okay. So let me introduce myself before we start. And uh, I am from, originally from Venezuela, a country located in the north of South America. I'm currently living in Brazil, the south of or side of Brazil. And I moved here like four years ago, running away from a dictatorship government. We are living there and looking for good music and, and a place to, to continue playing because that's what we love. And I am a harmonica player. And when I first took the harmonica, the blues was the first thing to go. And of course, Little Walter. And man, it's so nice to, to listen to, to Little Walter, even though I learn a song from Little Walter, no for no, but I enjoy listening to that. I could listen to that all day. And I got to you somehow through Facebook and all these social media. And I really look up to your guitar playing. And it's really interesting the way you, you do it because you are also instructed about the history of that music and you do very good tutorials so this instagram thing is really easy to do and i really need to take these opportunities and that's me i would love to, to know more about you and, and which part of california you're from and how everything started for you. well thank you for having me uh I'm uh, I'm excited to do this. We'll uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm kind of kind of new to Instagram and uh, doing this live stuff is is all new to me, but uh, I'll do my best. So, right. uh, how I discovered the music, uh, you know, my dad was was you know like a Rolling Stones fan, and you know he was always spinning vinyl of the Stones and guys like Sam Cooke and stuff like that. So that was kind of my my early introduction to blues related music you know um but it was about uh i don't know 93 or so um i had a job working um for haagen ice cream as a uh, merchandiser and uh in the front of the stores they would have these big cardboard bins of cassette tapes you know and i would be going through them and i'd find you know, the best of the blues kind of compilations you know, they have B.B. King and Muddy and Memphis Minnie. And, you know, I didn't know who any of these people were, of course, at the time, you know, but I was excited to, to listen. And, and, you know, I had my uh, cassette player in my car, you know, in between stops, I, I put this cassette in and and uh, I, was, I was just blown away, you know, by the sound, you know, Helen Wolf and, you know, Muddy Waters and these guys. I'm like, whoa, what? This is way different than the Rolling Stones, you know? Um, yeah. How long was that ago, Mark? That was about 1993. So, what is that? 30 years. <laughs> Great. Pretty pretty wild. It seems like yesterday, but uh, not so much. Yeah. So from then on, uh, uh, I think I really started getting heavy into Little Walter about 97, 98. You know, I was still you know, heavily influenced by classic rock, you know, 95, 96, you know, because that's all I was exposed to at the time, you know, besides these cassette tapes. But it took took a while to kind of catch on, you know. Um, you know, I was listening to B.B. King and more of the guitar, you know, heavy kind of blues, you know, early on. 
that was more relatable, you know, to me and what I was used to, you know. Um, but once I heard Little Walter and and how he worked with Muddy Waters and and these recordings and you know his stuff behind Memphis Mini, um, it was just it just I knew right away that was the sound that I wanted to to do, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, I moved to San Diego in about, I think, oh, oh, one. And then, um, uh, you know, I was going out to see live music, you know, um, well, actually before I went to San Diego, I was, I was going out, you know, to, to clubs, you know, and seeing local guys, uh, like James Harmon and, and Rod Piazza and these guys, I have a couple signs here I can, I can show. These are things I saved from from way back, and this is a it's a pretty cool Harmon poster from uh, the Blue Cafe. This is circa like 2000. I think I got everybody's autograph on there. And uh, great, and, and which autograph are those people? What's that? Yeah, those those autograph you have there from from who? In the first uh, from all the members of the band. This is Rod. This is his. His band, you know, he had Rick Holmstrom on guitar and and Honey and Steve McGallion and himself, you know. So I, you know, these are the kind of guys I was seeing at the time um, when I was still early on my guitar journey, you know. And, uh, and I took a couple lessons with with Rick Holmstrom, you know, and um, and then he hooked me up with Junior Watson. Just just one or two lessons, you know. They kind of showed me some chords and some some basic things to kind of get me going. And then uh, I moved to San Diego, and um, Nathan James, who was the guitar player backing up uh, James Harmon at the time, you know, he was living down there, and he had just started um, venturing out and doing solo shows. And so I'd go watch him and, and start talking to him, and he, he pointed me towards uh, Brad Caro uh, of the Blues Pharaohs, And uh, and through him, I met Mark Bukic, who um, is a harmonica play harmonica player I play with uh, to this day. You know, most of the time. And uh, and around that time, you know, also through Brad and Mark, I met Johnny Dyer, who you know grew up on the same plantation as Muddy Waters. You know, Stovall Plantation uh, in Mississippi. So I did some shows with him. And uh, here's some pretty cool things. This is Johnny Dyer here. This is circa maybe 04, 05, something like that. I don't know if you can see. But that's Johnny. Yeah, I can see that. Great. And uh, here's another one. Let me see the reflection. But... George Smith? No, that's Johnny Dyer and myself. Oh, Johnny Dyer, the same one you just showed me now. Yeah, yeah, this is Johnny. So, so you know, he he didn't like to drive at night. So, you know, we would do these gigs, and, uh, you know, his eyesight was bad, you know, driving in the, at night. So, you know, I would drive, and and uh, we'd come back after the gig late at night, you know, midnight or two in the morning sometimes, whatever. And a lot of times we'd sit in his driveway for two or three hours in the cab of my truck, you know, and he would sing – you know, and play acoustic harp. And he'd, you know, I'd get my guitar out just in the cab of my truck and we'd play there for two or three hours. And he would, we'd listen to songs, you know, on the, on my stereo and he'd point out different things. And, and he kind of, you know, gave me the confidence to, to play and kind of steered me, you know, towards the direction I, I ended up playing, you know. Oh, what a great history, man. So, Are you? Do you work like like a guitar teacher, or that's something you do for fun? Uh, I'm a family guy. I have you know five children, and you know I'm pretty busy with the business and stuff. So I don't get out to play too often. Um, but yeah, I do some lessons. I'm, I'm I'm happy to do more. I I enjoy teaching. You know I um, I don't know a lot of styles, but the, you know I know the few styles I know. I do. I think pretty well, um, and I can definitely, you know, teach people how to back the harmonica, you know, that kind of guitar style, you know. Great, man, because I, I would like to see, uh, do, you, do you have a guitar uh, close to you now? 
I would yeah, like I to see some of that, man. Uh, thank you for your YouTube lessons because they are very. I, I was getting some things. I play some guitar, not not really not much. I'm mostly harmonica player, but you know I like to play some chords and try to do something. And man, uh, I love these. You know, let me let me just make a way to to be able to take my guitar here. Yeah. How, how's how's the music scene in, in Brazil, by the way? Ah, it's a, it's a great music scene uh, for for the traditional Brazilian music and the and the modern Brazilian music, and uh, a lot of young people enjoying music and watching the blues bands where, where when they come from other places of the world. But it's, the blues is not a very popular genre down here. Yeah, I, I was down there a few years ago. Uh, I was brought down by the the, uh, the head cutters uh, and Nico Smolgen from Argentina. And, and those guys were just wonderful to me and great musicians and great people. And I really love the culture down there. And the, it was just an awesome place. And the fans were way... Sorry? What's that? Oh, I think we lost the connection for a little while. Oh, but I'm you sorry. were talking about about how cool was your experience in Brazil. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, when I went down to Brazil, I mean the head cutters and Nico Smolgen from uh Argentina, maybe I'm I'm yeah. probably butchering his name, but uh one of my favorite modern day harmonica players and uh the head cutters are great. Uh and the fans down there were just really warm and, and really appreciative of traditional blues music. You know, I was I was shocked. I mean, I'd, I've never received that kind of, um, you know, attention and, and, and praise and appreciation up here. You know, everybody up here wants to hear something else, you know. But down there, I mean, it sounds like you guys have a pretty good scene, you know, and uh, also in – in like some Scandinavian countries, it seems like there's a lot of traditional blues players coming up that are some of the best in the world. And uh, it's really exciting to see some young players and, and older players too, uh, you know, playing in a traditional way. Yeah, man, it's, it's really interesting for me too that I am not from here. See actual live blues music and, and people excited about that. I used to work with a guitar player in other states I used to live. And uh, he mixed set like a rock show with blues songs. Uh -huh. yeah. But it was really cool, man, playing with, with him. And uh, what I was going to, to say, but, uh, but thank you. I, I hope all Brazilians that are watching this video get that and... and yeah, and feel thankful about it. This is this is that I didn't know the this thing that you do, like like to do the the E chord, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Like so, I'm not definitely a guitar player, but uh, I got that from your lessons and so many other things to to really. Learn to play uh, and accompany uh, blues players, uh, har harmonica players. And that was really fun. So uh, I would really love to, if you don't mind, uh, showing you a couple of, of those tricks. Uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> my guitar is pretty quiet. Hopefully, you guys can hear, okay? Uh, I'll try to angle this down a little bit more. Okay. Can you hear that okay? Yeah, I can hear that okay. So, you know, you know, when I was going out, just to back up just for a second, when I was going out to clubs, you know, I was, I was hearing these, these guys, you know, mostly what you hear is, you know, West Coast Blues, which is kind of a swingier, you know, 
uh, you know, jazzier type of blues. And I liked it. But for me, personally, I, I like the, the more low down, you know, Chicago kind of stuff, you know, um, from, you know, the late 30s up through, you know, the early 50s, you know, that's, that's really my bag. And that's the stuff I like to play and listen to. Um, but as an example, you know, if you take like a classic intro, like, uh, that's all right by, uh, Jimmy Rogers slash Ornell, uh, you know, uh, by, uh, Otham Brown and little Walter recorded a few years earlier in 47. Um, you know, you know, I was playing it just the, the top end, you know, You know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, without a band, you know, it sounds kind of kind of empty, right? So, you know, I, over time, you know, I started listening to more of the country blues guys, or the early Chicago guys that were, that were, that migrated from the South, that were still playing a country blues style, more like a piano. So, you you know, your thumb is, is playing the low end, and your fingers are playing the, the top end, so you can support yourself. Or, you know, if you're in a solo, a duo, or a trio, you know, it it fills it up, you know? So so then you can do it like this. That kind of stuff, right? But if you yeah. take the the real low down stuff like Othan Brown was playing, he would stretch that out even further and, you know, muddy the same way. He would, he would really drag the beat. He would really drag the time. I think muddy called it delayed time where it's, okay. you know, it's, it's difficult to pull that off with a drummer because the drummers keep at a steady beat. But you know, when you're, these guys started out without a drummer, you know, and they would really drag this stuff out and, for me, that's that's the sound, you know. I I love I love dragging the beat. I, I love playing around with the timing, you know. So it sounds something like this, where you really like milk every drop of the note, you know. So like. You know that kind of stuff you know uh and I'm <laughs> a little sloppy but you got the idea let, let me see let me see if i got it you you start in a in a in a tempo and then you go on a slower yeah yeah so, you know they'll they'll do an intro from the five and then they'll kind of slow it down and really stretch it at the turnaround before the vocals come in to really set it up you know and give you that really deep low down gut bucket kind of sound you know i i i just love that sound you know robert nighthawk would do it he would even do it you know with with his slide playing he would like really stretch those notes and drag it out you know where you know a lot of modern guys you know they want to they want to be slick and they want to play they want to play a lot of notes in a you know in a small amount of space and and really are more focused in my opinion about impressing the listener, you know, these guys were just deep, deep, deep in the pocket, you know, and, and, and could say more with less. They were very economical kind of players. You know, they didn't have, a lot of them didn't have the, you know, they didn't study music. They didn't, they were just, you know, they went to church. They, they, they watched the guys around them playing on the street or whatever in house parties. And it was just a really deep, deep sound. And then you know, some of them didn't have a bass player. You know, they didn't have a drummer, a lot of them, you know, they're playing on the streets as a solo or duo act, you know, and, and, you know, on Maxwell Street in Chicago, and when they migrated from the south, they ended up in Chicago, a lot of them, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, some of them were, were playing, you know, lots of different kinds of music, you know, polkas and different things, they would play to the white audiences, and they would play whatever, you know, they thought would get them more money, you know, by who was walking by. But, you know, like in the 
in the late forties, it seemed like, you know, especially like the Muddy and Little Walter and Babyface Leroy, and Jimmy Rogers and that kind of headhunters core group, you know, <clears throat> it was 100% blues, you know, 100% blues. And, and the, and the Muddy would really drag the beat and, you know, on the grooves. And sometimes he'd play ahead of the beat on the, on his solo stuff. And, but Jimmy was more of a straight lace kind of player, Jimmy Rogers, and he would, he would back Muddy and that, they complemented each other really well because they had kind of two different approaches, you know, that complemented each other. Do, do you, can you exemplify the uh, the difference between Moody and Jimmy uh, accompanying something? Yeah, and you know, by listening to the records, you know, I try to pick up some money parts. I try to pick up some Jimmy parts, and you know, I, and and other guys, John Brim and Floyd Jones and Moody Jones, and um, I got some records here. I'd like to show you know the audience to to kind of oh, great, you know, but. Uh, um, You kind of, for me, I just, I, I take a little bit from this guy, a little bit from that guy. And I, you know, to keep the music authentic sounding and, and I throw it in a pot and stir it around and do my best to kind of make it my own sound. You know, no a lot way. of guys play the same kind of stock licks, but how you put those licks together is, is what kind of makes you have, you know, develop your own individual sound in a way, you know. So like, yeah, I, like, I an upbeat kind of, like an upbeat kind of thing. This is like a, I call this Mume Boogie. This is, uh, this is something I, you know, I put together a lot of my, my favorite guitar parts, you know, all in one, some of my own stuff. Uh, I'll give you a little taste of that. This is more like an up, up tempo kind of boogie kind of thing, right? So. Fine, man. So something like that, you know. I love this because uh, a lot of great things, you know, the boy things, some of the boy things uh, from Robert Lovewood. Uh, yeah. A lot of notes, uh, chromatic approach, but use it with a good taste. Yeah, uh, and you know, I, 
a lot of people, you know, focus on the left hand stuff, which of course you need to learn that. But really, what makes a big difference is the right hand technique. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm using my fingers. I'm not using a pick. You know, I started out using a pick, and it was difficult to make the transition to using fingers. You know, you hit you hit a lot of extra notes. You know, it's more of a kind of a sloppy kind of feel, but it's a warm sound. You can do a lot more with it. You know, uh, it's not that real hard you know, aggressive sound. It's a little softer. You have a little bit lighter touch, a little bit more feel, in my opinion. So, you know, I try to play with my fingers and, and thumb as much as possible. Um, yeah. That kind of that kind of thing. You know, I got this from from your tutorial on my harmonica. Yeah, let me see. What do you think about this? Yeah, sad hours, huh? But <laughs> yeah, 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 man. I've, yeah, you know, I've never played. I've, I've never played like like a uh, note for note, little Walter. I love listening to it, and, and I really want to play, but I never took the time to do it. So yeah, I I'm inspired by you and, and your lesson. I went and listened to a lot of little Walter, little Walter songs. And uh, man, little Walter is difficult to play on the harmonica, <laughs> to say the <laughs> least. I, yeah, yeah, that's that's one of my favorite set hours. Man. That's a that's a great song, man. Good job yeah. on that, man. That's cool. Thank you, man. Thank you. I hope uh, we could play it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speaking a little But, Walter. Uh, Mind if I give just a little history on that, on, on some little Walter stuff? I brought some okay. stuff, you know, a little show and tell. Let me, let me see if I can pull this off. So, um, <clears throat> can you see that okay? Yeah, I can see that, that, that uh, who? Yeah, so that's little Walter. Uh, In 1950, okay, on Maxwell Street, in front of where he used to, in, in front of the alley where he used to play, uh, near near Halstead. Okay, uh, yeah, and and up until recent, fairly recently, a few years ago, whatever, uh, it was kind of like uh, not known what year this picture was. You know, people were putting 48 and different different things you know nobody really knew but okay. uh if you notice down here if i can point to it right here that there's a license plate here that's white yeah okay so uh so in chicago you know through the through the war times 
the license plates looked like this, and they were made, of, made out of soy, right? Because they, they needed the metal for the war. So they made them out of soy. It's kind of like a cardboard kind of thing, right? Okay. Up until, I don't know, I think 48, I think was the last year. <laughs> here's 49 in metal. And here's the white plate that's on his car there. It's a 1950. And, and they alternated this, uh, you know, every year they would alternate this. The, the year would be on top, and then the next year it would be on the bottom. So in that picture, it's on the bottom, and it's white. And there's no other years close to that. So you know it's at least 1950. So that's kind of a cool little... And you discovered that, you, you discovered that on your own. Yeah, correct. Great, man. So... Uh, So in, in, 19, in 1947, um, little Walter made his first recordings for Ornell, uh, and that was Maxwell Street Radio uh, at 831 Maxwell Street. And um, okay. he recorded with Otham Brown, and then did some with Jimmy Rogers. And... Uh, I could never find, it took so long. I mean, I collected thousands of pictures of Maxwell Street trying to find this location, right? And uh, for a while, this is the closest I got. This is, this is next door to the location. Here's the location he recorded, 831 Maxwell Street. This is a few, this is in 43, so this is four years earlier, right? Okay. This is called Maxwell Maternity Center right here, okay? <clears throat> And I found a couple more from the same location, you know? So I was getting, I was getting, now it's upside down. I was getting closer, right? You can see just a sliver of it here, right? Yeah. I was getting closer. And then uh, I found, <laughs> I struck gold, okay? So here is, right here is where he recorded that in 1947, 831 Maxwell Street. And it's, it's, it, uh, it says that he, he recorded on the front steps of that building. Okay, this oh is Maxwell Street. A beautiful, beautiful shot of Maxwell Street. I think this is in 53, so a few years later. Um, and I found one other one. These are the only two color shots of, of this location that I've been able to find. Uh, so that's the building where he recorded in 47. Uh, okay. So he was, he was around, uh, around that area for, for many years, Little Walter. Uh, well, he migrated around a lot. You know, a lot of these guys kind of followed the same path. They were in the South and they kind of gradually worked their way up North, you know, to Memphis, you know, in And then they'd go up, you know, back home, and then they'd come back again, and they'd go to Chicago, and then they'd come back, and then they'd finally end up in Chicago and, and live with a relative or whatever and stay there permanently. Or, or you know, he would go off to Milwaukee or whatever, you know. They moved around a lot, but um, pretty cool. And man, uh, let's see. Little Walter life changes with the success of his music, like in that movie that everybody watches, Fabulous like Records. That really <laughs> yeah. happened. Yeah, I think a lot of that's fiction. Some of it's, you know, true, but it's, you know, it's got a lot of mixed in there. Um, but yeah, that, that, you know, that Ornell stuff, uh, the 831 Maxwell Street, I just really like that sound. Uh, you know, and Bernard Abrams, the owner, you know, would record these guys off the street of Maxwell Street on this little, um, it was, I guess it was like an army green colored um, Wilcox Gay uh, direct to disc recorder. And, you know, he would get these, you know, little Walter and Floyd Jones and guys like that. He would get off the street and he would record them right there in his shop. It was like a, like a maintenance shop for TVs and radios and things like that, you know. These guys would come in and, and he would record them right to a, a 78 disc. And then they, <clears throat> in turn, they would, they would take this disc and, and shop it around to try to get themselves gigs or recording deals, you know. Okay. So, you know, a lot of these guys that migrated to Chicago, uh, 
you know, ended up playing on Maxwell Street, um, you know, because they couldn't get any any gigs. Or they would, they would uh, a lot of guys, most of the guys that I mentioned would sit in with um, Sonny Boy Williamson, John Lee Williamson, and uh, guys like Snooky Pryor and Leroy, Babyface Leroy Foster and and Muddy himself and Jimmy Rogers. They, they sat in with Sonny Boy, and that's how they learned. Uh, you know, or that's how they got their start in Chicago, I should say. I mean, they were already playing before that, but that's how they got their their sound in Chicago from from Sonny Boy, you know, and then they kind of met each other and kind of made their own group, you know, the Headhunters, you know, uh, nope. with, you know, and that's that's my favorite stuff, you know, that like 1948, 49, 50 kind of kind of period, you know. Do you have some of the records or cassettes or, or LPs with yeah, you there? I, I, I'll show you some, some of my favorites. I, I pulled a few of my favorites out um, for anybody wanting to uh, to learn how to back a harmonica and learn the uh, the Chicago style. Okay. Um, so this is this is a great series here. I think it's a seven album series. If you're if you're still in a vinyl, uh, okay. This is this is uh, Fly Right is the yeah. label and and there's seven different volumes this is the job series volume one this has got robert lockwood jr um uh, johnny shines it's some some really terrific stuff this is a picture of robert jr um when he was playing for king biscuit uh flower hour with sunny boy for, and this is probably taken in uh i don't know 41 or 42, I'd say. You can see Peck Curtis back here. Um, before he was playing drums with the band, he was playing washboard. And he's he's sitting back here in this picture. Pretty cool. This is Robert Jr. Lockwood. Yeah. You can't see Sonny Boy in this picture, unfortunately, but but he's there. <laughs> uh, so that's number one in the series. Here's number two. Right? Same same brand. Fly Right, Volume 2. Okay. And this has got J.B. Lenore and... Uh, well done, this one. You know, Sunglass Slam and, and all kinds of stuff. So this is number two. <clears throat> number three, John Brim and Little Hudson. Uh, terrific stuff. You can see them there with the, uh, this is Little Hudson on the cover here with an old big jumbo arch top. And then, uh, Volume three, you got Snooky Pryor, you know, and he was backed by Muddy jo uh, Moody Jones and Floyd Jones. That's a classic harmonica player for everybody, Snooky Pryor. Snooky Pryor, man, he, uh, you know, there's pictures of John Lee Williamson, you know, he passed, I think, in 48, and there's pictures of him playing, you know, a bullet mic, you know, cupped, you know, so he, and, I think Billy Boy Arnold, you know, he was still very young, but he called Billy Boy and Bill, or he, I'm sorry, he called John Lee Williamson when he was on a gig. And uh, I think he could overhear him blowing, you know, amplified harmonica, you know. Um, so, I mean, the first recorded amplified harp was 1950, early 1950 by Snooky Pryor uh, backing uh, Babyface Leroy Foster. And then Little Walter, uh, his first amplified harp recording was about a year and a half later, I think, this summer, I think, of 51. But uh, it goes back further, you know? It goes back further. But Snooky is one of my favorite harp players. <clears throat> Here's, uh, what was it, Volume 4, Sunny, Sunny Land Slim. This has got all the Robert Jr. stuff on it, killer stuff. Okay. Robert Jr. kind of wrote the Bible on the... Uh, on how to back the harmonica player, you know. <clears throat> Robert Jr. is probably one of the most virtuoso uh, player. Yeah? Uh, his ability to accompany his right yes. hand moving, yeah, amazing. You know, he his early recordings. You know, he his stepdad for a while was was Robert Johnson. So he 
you know, would, would play. He played in that style, that heavy thumb, you know, kind of playing a country blues kind of playing, you know. Um, but later on, you know, he, he, he did more of like a jazzier approach and he was a really, you know, schooled musician. He could do all kinds of stuff that the other guys couldn't do, you know. So he, he kind of pushed the boundaries of, of how to back the harmonica, you know, in the, in the early fifties up to the mid fifties and beyond, you know, um, you know, all that stuff he did behind little Walter. And, and he was like the, the guitar session player, you know, in Chicago. Um, here's another one. This is uh babyface Leroy Foster and uh, Floyd Jones, same series. So you have the whole collection, right? I got them all, man. And in fact, I think this one, I have two, two copies. <laughs> <laughs> this, is me. this is the last one. So uh, that's a seven, seven album series. Highly uh, recommend those uh, for anybody trying to learn how to back the harmonica um, or just want to get a good overview of early Chicago blues. That's, that's the series right there. In addition, there's also this series here. Um, this Nighthawk series is great, man. Uh, 48 to 53, it's got little Walter, Floyd Jones, Johnny Shines, John Brim, uh, Sunny Land Slim, AKA Delta Joe, Robert Nighthawk, uh, Big Boy Spires, Earl Hooker, Forest City Joe. It's all great, great stuff. And this is this, also a series. I think that's uh, – here's another one from that series. We got Willie Nix and um, John Brim, Robert Nighthawk, Floyd Jones, Little Walter, all the same guys. Um, this one here has got – this one's hard to find. This one's pretty expensive if you, if you can find it. This is on Barrel House Records. This has all of the Ornell recordings from uh, from 1947, including the alternate takes of, you know, Elton Brown and Little Walter and Jimmy Rogers and Little Walter and, and other guys. Uh, uh, Johnny Young and, and Johnny Temple and all kinds of good stuff. That looked really great, man. This is a this is a good one, man. Hard to find, but worth the worth the effort if you can locate it. Here's a like a I think this is like an Italian import of uh, little Walter box set. Uh, pretty cool. Hey. That looks great, man. Uh, a couple more of my favorites. I man, I love the uh, you know, talking about Robert Jr. You know his his stuff with. Uh, with Sonny Boy Williamson, you know, the, number two, Rice Miller uh, on the King Biscuit Flower Hour. You know, this stuff is just dynamite, man. Okay, Sonny Boy Williamson. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, the King Biscuit Flower Hour started, I think, in uh, I think December of 40. Um, and I think, you know, start, you know, so basically 41, you know, I think, he was kind of solo, I think, right away. And then Robert Jr. joined him. Um, and it was a duo. And then I think in 42, 43, I think, uh, oh, boy. Um, uh, Joe Willie Wilkins uh, was the second guitar player. So they had two guitars back in Robert Jr. And then Robert Jr. left. And then it was, I think, just Joe Willie Wilkins and I think in 44, 45, Houston Stackhouse joined him. And then from there on, they had a bunch of other guys. But, you know, none of those none of those early days were recorded. You know, Sonny Boy didn't record, in, you know, until, you know, on trumpet until I think 1951, you know. And that was with Joe Willie Wilkin, Wilkins and, and um, Elmore James and, and a whole different uh, group, you know. But, I, you know, I wish... I wish we could hear what he was doing, you know, in the late thirties and early forties, you know, um, that would be something to hear. You know, that's kind of a big missing link in, in the chain of, of how, you know, how this was going on because, you know, up North, you know, John Lee Williamson was, was the harmonica guy in Chicago. And then in the South, Sonny Boy Williamson, Rice Miller was the guy. So, you know, and a lot of these guys that eventually ended up North, um, Muddy Waters and Jimmy Rogers and these guys, you know, came through, you know, they were exposed to uh, Rice Miller through the King, Bis King Biscuit Flower Hour, 
you know, during lunch breaks and things like that. They had this, I think it was a 15 minute show or whatever. Uh, and they were exposed to that. And then they would go and they'd sit in and, and that was their first, you know, uh, chance to play live, you know, back in, you know, Sunny Boy Up or Sunny Boy sometimes would take a super long break and disappear and go gamble and drink and stuff. And he'd have his band, you know, hold up the, the, the bandstand. That was, that was this, these guys' opportunity to, uh, to play, you know. Um, another guy from the South I really like a lot is uh, also a trumpet recordings, uh, Willie. Can, can you repeat? Can you repeat that name, please? Willie Love. Okay. <clears throat> really great stuff, man. And and like you know, to kind of demonstrate that kind of sound, it's it's uh, it's it's more like a single. They would do these single note runs, you know, and then kind of blend those chords in with it, you know. So. You know, I love that that single that single note playing like. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I I try to take some of that style and combine it with what the guys were doing in Chicago, uh, because on the albums, you know, in Chicago there wasn't a lot of guitar soloing going on. You know, it was back in the harmonica. You know, which. You know, I, I love back in the harmonica, you know, um, you know, you'd hear little runs from guys like Dave uh, and Lewis Myers, you know, in between the harp to, to accentuate the harp and and to kind of answer back that call and response kind of thing. Um, but looking for things to do for your guitar solo and stuff, that's that's a sound that that works pretty well with that. Um, um, and, you know, a lot of guys just are focused on a single note playing because it's really attractive, you know, it's really flashy, you know, but yeah, yeah. It, it makes a lot more of an impact in my opinion, when you combine that with chords, when you combine that with, you know, baseline patterns, you know, oh, yeah. if, if you heard, you know, I was throwing in those seventh chords and put in the little, the little bass run over the four and then I come back to the single note line. So you, you kind of, put everything together and the you know once you start with with the chords and the bass line you know the listener hears it even though you're not playing it you know and then you can sprinkle in those those single note runs you know and kind of go back and forth it's, it makes it interesting you know I, I like doing that kind of yeah, stuff yeah. that will be like your style then the, that? the mixture of everything yeah, well, you kind of put everything together. I, I you know, I, I think that's a lot more interesting than just playing single note stuff all the time, or just chords all the time, or just bass runs all the time. You know, you can, especially when you're working as a, a solo or duo act or even a trio. You know, to kind of mix things up and to keep things interesting. You know, a lot of players are afraid of of empty space. You know, they they feel like they have to always put something in there. You know, but these guys had such a such a, a sense of timing, you know, it's just like a clock going on. And you know, you have to be able to hear the music in your head in order to play it. You have to hear it in your head, you know, and once you start with that rhythm and you get it locked in in your head, then you're free to add other things, you know, without actually playing them. 
Um, so that, that's kind of my take on it. Wow, great, man. I love it. Yeah, really thank you for this time that you provided to me and to our audience that are watching us from all around the world. And uh, I really want to thank you for your time. And man, we can definitely do this again uh, some other time if you like. Anytime, man. I'm glad, I'm glad to... Uh... Glad to talk about this stuff, man. Who, with whoever will listen, you know. I, I, I'm really into this stuff. I like the history. I like playing. I like trying to figure stuff out. I like, you know, tying things together in an interesting kind of new way. Whatever. I like talking about it. You know, with people that are passionate about it. Uh, it's kind of hard to find. Uh, I'll. Uh, let me close with a couple of things. I, I brought a little more oh, sure. detail. Great, man. Don't mind. So. Uh, so here's a, a picture of Muddy. This is at the 708 Club in Chicago. This is probably, uh, I don't know, 53 to 55, somewhere around there. Uh, but pretty cool, man. And you can see, oh, yeah. look at man, this is, this is how I know you were cool, man. You ready for this one? Yeah. See the notes in the, in the back? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah like, have, like, like this one, that's right? right. That's right, man. <laughs> so in the 708 Club, in the early days, they had, you know, these notes and, and stuff in on the back wall. You know, there's like a piano thing. And, and I actually like all the 708 pictures that exist. I put them all together and like did a compilation to see exactly what that back wall looked like at that time, which is pretty cool. I don't have that handy, but, but uh, later on, just a few, this is probably 54, 55, 56, I don't know, somewhere around there. This is Lewis Myers, Dave Myers, playing Gold Tops with uh, Junior Wells. And this is the same place, same location, but there's a curtain on that back wall. They covered up, oh, yeah. they covered up those musical notes. So you can kind of like know the, the year by, by knowing if the curtain's there or not, you know? Uh, that's pretty cool though, and it's got the Masco amps up on the top of the piano. You know the house PA. Yeah, uh, pretty cool shot. Uh, and then um, you know, Muddy Waters is known for his later stuff. You know, with, with the Telecaster and the heavy slide and stuff. But you know, he did all his early recordings on a guitar similar similar to this, uh, different okay. brand, it was a Gretsch. Uh, here's here's a picture of him in you know, the late 40s with his Gretsch. Okay. And uh, here's another. Okay. And so these guys- but That's not a Gretsch. That, that last one is not a Gretsch or it is. No, it, it's a Gretsch. It's the same guitar as the other one. It's, it's called okay. a Gretsch. Uh, synchromatic, I believe. And that's what he recorded his, his early aristocrat sides on. And, uh, you know, these guys would, you know, before they bought electric guitars, before electric guitars were available, you know, they they would take their acoustic guitars, their their arch tops like this, and they would buy a mm -hmm. DRM and pickup. Okay. All right. And that's one of those? That's one of those. That's what Muddy used, and that's what all those guys in the late '40s used. You know, great man. So, kind of cool. That's about all I have, man. Well, thank you very much. Can you, can you, just to close up, can you show me that premiere amp? Oh and, yeah. And talk, and talk a little bit about it. Uh, uh, what? This is a great. I, I know those are famous. famous. What's that? I know those are famous. Premier and National Amps, probably my two favorites. Uh, this is a Premier Fifty. This is, I think, from nineteen forty-nine, I believe. That's it's, got, it's got the, it's got the little, 
a little pocket here to put the cord in. Uh, real simple mm -hmm. amp, two inputs, just on and off. You know, it's got tone and volume up top. It's a little dusty. Uh, it needs to be serviced, but it's it's in mint condition. And when it was re when it was working, it absolutely one of my favorite amps. A great great amp. But you know this this kind of music, you know it it's uh, it, it's not loud music. You know uh, it's I, everybody wants these basements and stuff like that. But you know for me, I, I like you know an eight to twelve watt, maybe fifteen watt amplifier. You know with a drummer. But without a drummer, you know, five to twelve watts is is all you need, man. And that's that's the sound because you want a you know a sound where when you back off the note, it's just quiet. You know, um, you need that space, you know, to build it up. You know, um, and, and I'll show you one more thing. Right. So, uh, Thank you. So you know, little Walter, these instrumentals that he did off the wall and. And don't have to yeah. hunt and, and all these kind of things. Um, you know, he was telling a story, you know, he would, he would build it up and then he would come back down and build it up and come back down. And the band knew exactly how to follow him, you know? Um, and, you know, if he was going to come back down, you know, he would build it up. And then for the turnaround, he might just play one or two notes instead of playing every single note, he would just play one or two notes and let the band kind of, you know, do the turnaround to kind of reset, you know, and then, and then he would, you know, that would give him a, a second or two to, to think about where he wanted to go next, you know, which he was so good. He, he, he probably already had that. He already knew what he was going to do, but for most of us, you know, that extra second or two, you know, is, is really helpful, you know? So, you know, you go. And bring the volume down. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you very kind of much. <laughs> so you know you're you're playing again. You're playing chords. You're playing the bass lines. You know you're playing you know some single note stuff for the turnarounds. You're mixing it up. You know to keep it interesting for yourself and for the listeners and <clears throat> to to bounce ideas off the harmonica and respond to what he's doing. You know it, it goes yeah. together. You know. Were Were you able to listen to me playing? It's it's hard to hear on the phone. My speaker's like oh yeah, it's really hard. Quiet. But you know what I what I did was just play one note uh, like like little Walter will do like.
And then uh, I, I, I stopped to play in the turnaround because you were playing very actively. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's, I, I wish we could do more of a, like a, you know, work together kind of situation. I wish that the audio was better where, you know, we could play and, and, and kind of demonstrate oh, how yeah, that works. Oh, yeah. No, man, you know, let's keep in touch and we should definitely make uh, a way to, to play something at least recorded and then put it together. I don't That'd know. That'd be fun, man. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's keep in touch and, and do, definitely do that. So, man, really thank you uh, one more time. Remember, uh, this is going to be recorded and, and posted uh, on my Instagram. And then I'm going to work on transcribing this uh, so I can put it uh, on a magazine project that I have because this is simply my personal profile. But I want to do more than that, more than me playing. I want to connect with people from all around the world. So it's uh, a huge opportunity we have. And I'm going to continue doing this. And thank you very much, man, for your time. So uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you and to everybody. And hopefully we keep in touch, man. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh Thank you for everybody that uh, tuned in. Hopefully, hopefully I didn't talk too fast. It was a lot of information to cover. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> and for you, Marcos, if, if you're going to transcribe it and you have some questions or whatnot, you need me to like, you know, throw some names oh, at yeah. you or Thank whatever, you. feel free to contact me or anybody else for that matter. I'm happy to help however I can. Uh, that's it, man. Good luck on, on your journey. You. Thank you. Let's keep it right, talking. Bye-bye, man. Or you too.